So I'm going to apologize in advance. My internet has been pretty lousy, regardless of where I am in my house today. So Hopefully it'll cooperate now. Yeah. All right. Well, I have 3.30. It's January 26th. This is the January 26th uh, Board of Waterworks Trustees meeting, and I show that uh, all five board members are online and a number of other people. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first up on the agenda is the consent agenda, which includes minutes from the January 22nd Board of Waterworks Trustees meeting, January 5th minutes for the Planning Committee, January 5th minutes for the Customer Relations Committee, uh, and January 12th minutes for Finance Audit Committee. Financial statements, list of payments for December, summary of CEO approved expenditures in excess of $20,000, review and approve reserve funds, investments policy, review and approve uh, depositories for Des Moines Waterworks funds, and the next meeting date of February 23rd, 2021. I think Ted is going to mention or going to pull something out to talk about, but before we do that, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. And Ted, you had something you wanted to discuss there? Graham, I simply wanted to point out um, to the board that in January each year we do include the two items that you mentioned there, uh, reserve fund investment policy and depositories for Des Moines Waterworks funds. Those are two items that we don't see every month. I just wanted to make the board aware that they were there and being approved as part of the consent agenda. Great. Are there any other questions or comments about the items included in the consent agenda? Hearing none, Michelle, please take a vote. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. All right. This is the point in our meeting for public comment. Is there anyone here today who wishes to address the board on some item? It doesn't appear so. Um, so we'll move into action items. Item 3A is the receive and file of the customer service uh, report. Um, we've talked about this quite a bit, but Ted, why don't you sum this up for us? Sure, Graham. Um, in 2017, Des Moines Waterworks hired Raftelis to review our cost of service methodology and, and to ensure uh, that we were following uh, generally accepted industry practices. That was done um, at the request of, of the board. As I recall, uh, RAF TELUS included or recommended several changes, including changing from a historical cost model to a forward-looking model. Uh, we did implement that change and staff used the RAF TELUS model to inform 2021 rate setting before rates were approved in October. Um, subsequent to that, staff has now prepared a, an executive summary of that model and the process. As you mentioned, Graham, we've talked about this a number of times at various um, committee meetings and even board meetings. And uh, today we are here asking that the board receive and file uh, that cost of services study. So this is a sim very, fairly simple process. I'm looking for a motion to accept and file the cost of service study. Moved. And is there a second? And there is a second. Are there any comments, questions, thoughts, observations? Uh, my only comment is that the title is receive and file. And later on, it talks about accept and file. I think there are no differences between those, but they probably should be consistent. I agree. Um, 
So the motion is to accept and file the cost and service study, and that was what was seconded. Is there any issue with that language? All right, hearing none. Um, all right, so with that, I'll take a vote. Please, Michelle. Ashbrenner? Yes. Bolton? She was having trouble with her internet, so. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> there, she's back. Philip? Yes. Hopper? Yes. Munz? Yes. Thank you. All right. So this moves us to item 3B, which is the award of the 2021 Tank Painting Pleasant Hill Tower in Wilchinski Wilch Standpipe. Um, this is a public hearing. So um, with that, I'll open the public hearing for comments from the public concerning the project's form of contract plans and specifications. Is there anyone here from the public that would like to speak on this item? All right, seeing and hearing none. Um, and uh, Ted, have we received any comments from the public? Graham, we have received no comments from the public. Great. So one more second here to see if there's anyone here that wants to address this. If not, I will close the public hearing. Um, and Ted, am I correct to say that the uh, project reflects appropriate coordination of existing infrastructure and that there are no suitable facilities available for rent or sharing in lieu of the project? That is correct. Great. So I am seeking a motion to approve the project's form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. And a second. And we'll take a vote on that, Michelle. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Munz? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, and then, Ted, if you could provide us an analysis of the bids, please. Absolutely, Graham. I, I would like to point out this is an excellent opportunity for us to cooperate with one of our total service customers, actually bundling a painting of one of our tanks with the painting of their tower to get the best possible price. For both, we actually had uh, quite a bit of interest in this project. We had uh, a dozen um, bidders who attended the pre-bid discussion. Seven bidders took out plans and specifications. And we actually had seven bids submitted, but you'll see that there are only three listed here because in a very unusual set of circumstances, we had um, four bids that were non-compliant and, and so were not accepted. Um, three of the bids were submitted with uh, out a separate uh, bid security, which is required in our instructions. And the fourth bidder failed to use the bid bond form that we that we require, which is again included in the instructions and actually part of the packet. So unfortunately, we weren't able to receive or accept those bids, but we did get three very favorable bids. Um, the engineer's estimate for the project was 1.6 million. Um, the low bid for the two tanks and associated alternates was uh, $1.1 million submitted by J.R. Seltzer and company. Uh, J.R. Seltzer is, is located in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. They've successfully painted a number of tanks in the region and staff would recommend that the board award the contract to J.R. Seltzer. I anticipate there might be some questions, especially about those um, bids that uh, we were not able to take. But before we have those questions and uh, discussion, I'm looking for a motion to award the 2021 tank painting Pleasant Hill Tower Wilchinski Standpipe contract to J.R. Stelzer Company for the base bids and alternates combined in the total amount of $1,145,524 and authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute the contract. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And, and a second? Second. And we have a motion and a second. Any comments on this um, or questions about the, the bids that were not success or were not complete? 
Yeah, Ted, is it, was the issue merely an envelope issue or the lack of bid security? I'm a little confused by the wording here. Yeah, the, Joel, the, the instructions, and I think Michelle may have an example of the instructions that are provided in the bid packet, the packet of materials that the contractors receive. Um, the, you can see there, number two, the bid bond. Well, there's a bid bond required in an amount of 10%. That's item number one on the instructions. Number two is that the bid bond um, should be in a separate envelope, not with the proposal. We require that because we can't open the bid if we don't have appropriate security. We can't read the bid, and so we do require that it be in a separate envelope. Um, if the bids are received and they're uh, not uh, there's not a separate envelope. Frankly, we don't know whether there was a bid bond or not. We just know it's not in a separate envelope. And um, so the problem was that there was not a separate bond provided for us to review before we opened the bid. I honestly can't say whether there was a bond or not. What we know is that there wasn't a separate envelope. Um, you know, I think part of the challenge here, Joel, was that um, some of these contractors were first time bidders with us. Some of them were out of state contractors. Some of them received their bid packet electronically. And if they receive it from us, we literally give them the envelopes that are intended to be for bid security and, and the bid itself. And um, it's sort of a, a, a perfect storm, but it's incredibly unusual for us to have that many bids that are uh, not opened. I was going to ask, but I think you just answered this, that this is very unusual. I mean, if it were, if we had more occasions, we may wonder about the clarity of the instructions, but that's not the case from what I understand. It's, we occasionally have a bid that um, is submitted without it follow, following the instructions. Um, you know, there are only six instructions, but they're fairly specific. And we do occasionally have a bid that doesn't pass muster, but to have this many on one contract, I think is unprecedented. Ted, just to be clear, you know, obviously my concern here would be eliminating bids or low, you know, potentially lower bids um, and costing the entity more money. So what is the purpose of requiring the bond to be in a separate envelope? And what, what do we lose if, if it's not? You know, the, the, the risk there, I guess, is that we cannot accept a bid if it's not secure. We can't open the bid. We can't read the bid. We can't accept the bid. And so while that, that is not required by statute, it is not required that the bid security be in a separate envelope. That has been our practice for many years to ensure that we have the documentation that we need to legally open and read aloud the bid before we get into the bid itself. Now, um, that said, does has it created a, a a challenge in the past, occasionally it has. Um, would we have to do it that way? Uh, no, we wouldn't. But, you know, out of the hundreds or even more bids that we've opened, um, this is unusual. And um, it's been a successful practice. Are you saying the statute prevents you from reading and opening a bid that doesn't have a bond? It prevents you from receiving a bid. And I, I don't know what the exact wording is. And I don't know if Rick can help me out with that, what the exact wording is. But I know that we cannot accept a bid that isn't properly secured. Yeah, um, the, um, the bid bond requirement is an express statutory requirement for a valid bid. And the lack of a bid bond uh, is fatal to the uh, capacity of the board to accept the bid. <clears throat> and the purpose of bid bond is to make sure that when the bid comes in, that the, there's an assurance that 
entity making the bid will actually enter into the contract and sign the paperwork. And so it's a pretty serious requirement. Uh, and I can second Ted's view that the requirement of a separate envelope has been the practice of the waterworks for a long, long time, as, as long as I can remember. And I think it's also probably the standard practice in the construction contracting community. Um, I don't think this was a thing that was invented at the waterworks. I think it's what everybody does. And I, I want to say two things about this. One is I don't think that with respect to these particular bids that we could change it at this point. We gave notice that failure to comply with all the requirements would render the bid incompetent or non-compliant. Um, so I feel like if we're looking at this, it needs to be prospective. But the second thing is um, Ted, what could you or someone from Waterworks get back to these bidders and explain to them what happened so that they can do it correctly next time? Uh, absolutely, Diane. In fact, I suspect that that has been been done, but we will ensure that it is done. I'd also say the failure to submit the bond in the proper form is uh, also a serious uh, defect. So there were two defects here, not just the envelope one. You know, Graham, in my previous role, I used to do a lot of bids and um, you would almost hope that a new vendor would not follow the bid rules and kind of stumble on this. Um, but I think seriously, the reason that it is so important is if we did not have the bids secured and if we looked at the bid and it happened to be lower, but it was not secured, that would not give us the basic financial um, confirmation or assurances that they could fulfill it. It's not the easiest and quickest thing to get a bid bond. And so somebody needs to be on top of it and know what they're doing. Well, and I would say that, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when Ted and I talked about this, you know, one thing I think Ted's offered to do and suggested that the staff would do would be, to, you know, to look through these instructions to make sure they were uh, easy to understand if there was something that was going to miss. Um, one of the things Ted thought he would do is give it to an employee that maybe hadn't seen it before and, and let them look through it and make sure that it made sense to them. Um, because to Joel's point, uh, we want to make sure that everything's consistent. Um, you know, that it's, you know, if it's our rule or it's statute, that it's consistent and easy to understand. So, you know, maybe it's just an opportunity or for us to look back to make sure we're doing things uh, logically that actually protect the bids and, you know, that it's, it's written in a way that's easy to understand. I mean, there's six points. It appears to me that it's pretty simple, but it's not a bad, not, not a bad opportunity to go back and look at that again. So. And Graham, the other thing we could do, if there are going to be a number of newer um, bidders that would be interested is you can include a bid security envelope as far, part of the package when they pick it up. That's an um, quite often that's in a brighter color or stamped across it that says bid security, you know, with the disclaimer that without this, your bid will not be open. Sure. sure. And I think to Diane's point too, the one thing that Ted and I discussed as well is if they call these bidders that were, uh, that did not uh, submit complete bids, maybe get some feedback to them of why they missed it. Um, if that, that may tell us something too, so. Is there information of how to contact whomever at Waterworks if there are any questions associated with these instructions that I'm seeing here? Yeah, there's a document in the bid package that's instructions to bidders and it, if they have questions, it tells them specifically who to call. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I think all this discussion is a great discussion and we should definitely investigate and learn from this opportunity. As someone that deals with receiving um, bids, not quite to this, this uh, intricacy, um, my first response is, well, if you didn't bother to call me and ask me to help clarify and you can't follow the instructions, I don't know if you're a great, a great contractor to work with in general. Um, but I definitely think this is a learning opportunity for us since there were so many um, that had problems with this, but 
I'm definitely comfortable with moving forward with the one that um, we have selected today. Agreed. Right. Any other comments, questions, thoughts on this item or the bid process in general? We have a, a motion in a second. So Michelle, if you could take a vote. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hopper? Yes. Munz? Yes. Okay, so this is uh, item 3C, the Mid-American Energy Company Underground Gas Easement Amendment. This too is a public hearing. So with that, I will open the public hearing. Um, are there any members of the public here that wish to comment on the project's form of contract plans and specifications? Giving a good Zoom pause to see if there is anyone. Um, I don't. I don't see anyone or hear anyone. So, um, Ted, uh, have there been any comments received from the public? There have been no comments, Graham. No comments. So with that, I will close the public hearing and um, ask Ted to confirm for me that the uh, project reflects appropriate coordination of existing infrastructure and that there are no suitable facilities available for rent or sharing in lieu of the project. Is that true, Ted? That is true. Excellent. So now I'm seeking a motion to approve the project's form of contract plans and specifications and estimated cost. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. second. Excellent. And uh, with that, we can take a vote, Michelle. Aye. Uh, Ashburn? Yes. Be be before we vote, Graham, I've kind of lost track of what item we're addressing here. This is item 3C, Rick. This is the public hearing on the Mid-American Energy Company underground yeah, okay. gas I'm sorry, I should have jumped in earlier. This isn't a contract award. This is an easement. And you are public, correct. And the public hearing is um, a hearing on approval of the easement. So we aren't doing, we shouldn't do a motion on approving the contract form and all that sort of stuff. And this, I apologize this for lollygagging a little bit. I was looking at a statutory thing. And no, and that's all right. I should, have, I should have caught it myself. Uh, this is my first time back doing the, my favorite public hearing um, parts of our meetings. And I miss that too. So I withdraw um, the motion then, Graham. We, would, we will not have a motion on that effect. Thank you. Um, so um, let's see. So the next part of this is to, is to gather a, or to get a motion to authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute the Mid-American Energy Company Underground Gas Easement Amendment. Is that the I'm, right motion? I'm sorry. I think we should perhaps first open the public hearing that's properly good. titled relating to the easement, since that's the formality we're talking about. The, we the did public. open. Well, we did. We can we go back that. and make that clear. I did read that this was the Mid-American Energy Company okay. underground gas easement amendment. We had a public uh, hearing to that effect. Where I went wrong was where we were talking about the um, reflecting the combination of okay. existing infrastructure. So okay. I think we're okay on that front. Okay, sorry about that. And again, no I should jump in earlier. Okay. No, it's my fault. Uh, so I'm looking for a motion to authorize the chairperson and CEO and general manager to execute the Mid-American Energy Company Underground Gas Easement Amendment. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. And we have thoroughly confused all everyone involved here, but I appreciate that. Ted, board, are there any other questions or comments on this item? No comments, Graham, but I, I would point out that this um, there's an existing easement for an existing gas main. The board has probably already noted in the memo that the gas main passes under the Raccoon River and Waterworks Park and has become exposed in the bank of the river. Mid-Am simply wants to relocate, replace that main adjacent to the existing, and that's what the amendment is for. Understood. Maybe you just said this, uh, any trails or other amenities facilities affected by this? In the park? No, Joel, um, actually the, the main comes down the west side of 30th Street, and uh, they are going to bore from the south side of George Flag, under George Flag, under the river, and 
into a, a little used part of the park uh, north of the Raccoon River, straight north of the intersection of George Flag and 30th, actually a little west of straight north, but no impact on park facilities. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this easement amendment? Hearing none, Michelle, please take a vote. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Muttons? Yes. Thank you. All right. Public hearing fun has been put behind us. We're moving on to item 3D. This is request authorization to reimburse the city of Des Moines for River Bend and King Irvin sewer separation phase 2A project. Um, before I get a motion, maybe Ted, you can explain this to us. Yeah, Graham, thank you. Uh, we actually brought this project to the board for permission to reimburse the city in December of 2018, but this has been kind of a messy project. The original permission granted was to reimburse the city about $170,000. But uh, through the course of the project, there was a detention pond constructed, which resulted in an additional 114 feet of pipe that had to be replaced. There were a couple of uh, unanticipated alterations where new sewer conflicted with existing main that had not originally been planned for replacement and a couple of additional hydrants that ended up having to be replaced. So the total of additional work that had to be done on the project was actually over $100,000, $103,000 more specifically. And so we wanted to bring this back to the board again and ask for permission to reimburse the city again, but instead of 170,000 roughly, uh, we need to reimburse the city 273,342.86. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to authorize the staff to reimburse the city of Des Moines, River Bend, and King Irving sewer separation phase 2A project in the revised amount of $273,342 and 86 cents. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second. second. And we have a motion. Any questions or comments on this item? Yeah, hey Ted, when, uh, when there are change orders like this, um, at what part in the process are we made aware um, that there are going to be some significant cost increases. You know, Andrea, we're, we're usually pretty much on the front line of that when they run into the problems out in the field. We have an inspector as an example that would inspect uh, our part of the construction. And when these things come to light that the existing main is, is going to be impacted by this detention basin where originally it wasn't expected, we, we become aware of that pretty quickly and, and before the work is done um, so we're, we're there. Um, our, our goal is always to understand the magnitude of the project before it's bid and awarded, but that just isn't always possible when we're working underground and we can't see exactly what's there. Sure. Do we have any, um, play any role in identifying solutions when we have these types of change orders or is it just kind of understanding what the city is dealing with and being aware as they move forward? I would say that we, we absolutely have opportunity and the, the city in my experience is pretty flexible in terms of trying to work through these in a way that doesn't result in additional expense, but maybe Mike McKernan could elaborate a little more on that point. I would essentially echo your comments there. There are there are times there where there's clearly opportunities and we try and be constructive and productive in those situations. Um, there are other times when, you know, we may have tried to, you know, complete a project with, with without doing an alteration in a certain location and then, you know, conditions change in the field and you, you become aware that, you know, we need to do an additional alteration. At that point, you're, 
th there's really little to debate. Uh, you just need to, you know, commence with uh, some additional work. And Mike, I, I would offer that when we are planning these alterations, we try to be conservative and replace or relocate just what is necessary. We don't um, replace everything just in case. We replace only what we're confident is gonna be in conflict. And so we do occasionally run into things where um, we were a little too conservative in our estimates, but we would rather do that than replace everything wholesale and end up replacing a lot that didn't need to be replaced. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. And it, it's not in the memo here, but it's interesting. Some of the pipe that, you know, we had to move here was installed in 1889. And, you know, we, we were not intending to replace it. Uh, <laughs> uh, an aged asset that was still, you know, delivering for the customer. So yeah, we're, we're very selective, Ted, about trying to make that capital improvement dollar go further. All right, any other, yep. any other comments or questions on item 3D? Hearing none, Michelle, please take a vote. Ashburner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Months. Yes. Thank you. All right. Item 3E is the request authorization to solicit bids for nitrate removal facility crawl space renovation and establish the date of a public hearing as the date of the March 2021 board meeting. Um, before I uh, seek that motion, perhaps you can walk us through this, Ted. Yeah, Graham, I would I would certainly put this one on the list of, of things that uh, we wish we didn't have to do, but it's it's a have to do. Um, our nitrate removal facility, which you're all familiar with, was constructed on top of our clear well here at Fluor Drive, and there's a, a crawl space below the floor of that facility and above the uh, clear well that um, is. Uh, occupied by basically the support structure that holds the, the nitrate removal, removal facility and specifically the vessels up. Um, it's, it's kind of a dark, damp place. And, and unfortunately, over the years, um, some of the brine solution that is used in the nitrate removal process has leaked down there. And that's been um, very hard on the structural steel and even the concrete that was down there. Um, the original design um, had protected the steel and the concrete, but over the last nearly 30 years, um, those protections have degraded and allowed the concrete and the steel to be uh, corroded. And so this project is uh, simply to go in and, and remove those uh, protective coatings and replace them with a newer generation of, of even more protective coatings that we hope will protect the roof of the clear well, if you will, and the structural steel under the nitrate removal facility for a good long time. And we're asking today for permission to uh, solicit bids for that project. So I'm seeking a motion to authorize staff to solicit bids for the nitrate removal facility crawl space renovation and establish the date of the public hearing as the date of the March 2021 board meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Second. And uh, any comments or questions on this? I have one, Ted, as you, uh, obviously as folks get underneath this facility, it makes me think this is an aged piece of equipment that is um, scientifically a little bit out of date. It uses an old process. What is our timing to evaluate the lifespan of this nitrate removal facility and if we need to upgrade it and that sort of thing? You know, um, great question, Graham. We uh, had a consultant do a fairly um, exhaustive analysis of our nitrate removal capacity and options for expanding that capacity. In fact, part of that evaluation was trying to understand trends of nitrate concentration in the river. It's really a, a complex um, process to determine 
um, not what the load will be, but what the actual concentration will be that we're going to have to remove. And they made some recommendations to us um, before we went into the long range planning process. Um, they recommended actually that we about double the size of our nitrate removal facility and upgrade um, the existing vessels and upgrade the resin, um, not because it's no longer effective, but just to the latest, greatest technology. Subsequent to that, um, we have decided to pursue a, a little bit different path, which is to try to acquire some shallow groundwater along the Des Moines River between uh, Prospect Park and Interstate 8035. We believe that there's a lot of shallow groundwater to be had there that uh, will be naturally lower in nitrate and will also help protect us from the toxin problems, the microsystem problems that we're having on the Des Moines River seasonally now. So we've really put any kind of expansion or upgrade of the nitrate removal facility on hold for now until we figure out how much um, lower nitrate, low toxin water we can harvest from that potential well field. And because we've sort of put this on hold, we think it's important to go ahead and um, get the structural steel and concrete underneath the facility protected. We anticipate that we'll be using this facility as is for a number of years going forward. A great question. So, so there, if I just make sure I understand correctly. So um, as we pursue this um, shallow ground, this shallower groundwater, that would provide us, once we tap into that, that provides us ability to tap that water when concentrations are high on our other source, correct? That's right. And, and then, but, and, but we don't ever anticipate saying we won't need the nitrate removal facility. No. The question is, to what extent we'll need it? Is that, am I saying that correctly? Right. We believe that we don't need to expand it, but we're not going to be able to do without it. We're, we're always gonna need surface water in our estimation. And there's always the chance we'll have to remove nitrate from that surface water. But we think we can develop a low nitrate source that will um, allow us to meet our nitrate removal needs with the existing facility. And in any case, well, in either case, whether, well, do we think we need to examine the technology we're using at the nitrate removal facility or are we confident that that's gonna that's going to continue to service in the near future we're confident graham that the technology is going to continue to service the consultant who did the report ch2m hill who now has become jacobs but when they did that analysis and somebody nathan or Mike might have to jump in here for me but when they did that analysis they gave us some options and if you'll recall, one of the options was potentially constructing a very large nitrate removal wetland in the western part of the park. And that's why we built this small nitrate removal wetland as a, as a model to help us understand how that could work. That was a, a, an option. Reverse osmosis was an option. Expanding our existing ion exchange nitrate removal facility, same technology, likely with a new uh, resin was also an option. Based on that analysis, we feel like ion exchange is still a viable nitrate removal technology. Uh, we may at some point change the resin to something that's more specifically targeted at nitrate, but we think it's a viable technology uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, Mike, uh, Nathan, would you add that or improve on that in any way? Uh, uh, I can I can add to that. Uh, uh, ion exchange is still to to today um, the most commonly used technology to remove uh, nitrates. Um, uh, it's also the most cost effective method, uh, and so. While it might be an old technology, it's still the preferred choice. That doesn't mean that won't change in the future, um, but uh, that's kind of how we ended up the way we are. Uh, 
I don't think anybody's in favor of expanding the nitrate removal facility, which is why we continue to look for options, which is what led us to the, to the well field. So, and that's kind of how we landed where we are now. It's helpful. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments on item 3E? Hearing none, Michelle, would you record a vote, please? Ashbrenner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Munns? Yes. Thank you. All right, item 3F, um, there's no recommended action here. These are the appointment of um, uh, appointments to not only our, our internal boards, but to those where we have representatives outside, which is Sirdwick, uh, the Des Moines Waterworks Park Foundation in the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden. One of the things I'd, I'd, I think I've mentioned in our last meeting, but then I'll, I've mentioned to, to board members individually, I'd like us to consider um, in light of our regionalization talks and other things, but also just because it's probably a good thing to do periodic, periodically anyway, is, and that is that the missions, if you will, of each of these committees is clear enough. And when I first discussed this, and maybe this is appropriate uh, for the committees to adopt individual charters uh, that it, are clear once I spent a little time reading, reading through the, the policy manual, it occurred to me that once the board looked at these, you may, the board may decide that what is written in the policy manual for a committee or all of the committees is enough and we don't need another charter or individual charter for, for each committee. Um, I don't have an opinion on that. I would just like for the committees at, at a future agenda of, the of each of these committees for some discussion about the need for a charter and what a charter would look like if, if it's felt there is a need. Um, Sue and I, and I think others have talked, but Sue and I talked specifically about the customer relations committee, maybe the one that's is either going to change or at least is probably the one in most need of attention. Quite honestly, the customer relations committee may wanna table that discussion for about six months or so uh, as we work through regionalization and revisit that charter. Um, it, it may be the, the wish of the board uh, later this year to actually disband the customer relations committee if we feel that it doesn't have uh, an ongoing purpose or in, in, uh, if, if, it, if not to disband it, to, it may meet less frequently than the other boards. It may, it may meet on an as needed basis. Again, I don't think we, none of that has to be decided today. Um, all I'm requesting is that at a future committee meeting of each of these committees that we give some thought to the mandate, the charter, call it what you want of each of these committees to make sure that uh, what's in our policy manual is clear, not only to us, but clear to the people uh, that we serve. Uh, so when the public looks at this, they understand uh, the purpose of these committees. Any feedback, comments on that request? Great. Well, I appreciate that. And I look forward to our ongoing discussions about all of those things. Um, moving to item 3G, this one, I don't know, I, this one's kind of emotional, isn't it? I mean, this is one where it's a passing of the baton with uh, Peggy Freeze's retirement and Amy uh, Kaler stepping into her shoes. Um, we are well served to have Amy Kaler, in my opinion, to be able to do this. But Peggy has served uh, Des Moines Waterworks for 25 years, as I pointed out to you guys last earlier this month. So um, what I'm looking for here is, is a motion, and this may be, uh, uh, we just wanna make sure we're doing everything correctly here, but a motion to appoint Amy Kaler CFO as treasurer of the Board of Waterworks Trustees, effective January 30th, 2021. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. And a second? Second. Any comments or thoughts here before we vote on this? Yes, I don't know where we do this, but I certainly wish Peggy the, the best, best of luck. And 
I'm sorry, we can't have a big party for you. It's just the way it is, but know that uh, we appreciate your service and thank you so much. That is unfortunate we can't have a, pe a party. She, she does deserve that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions on this? Well, Peggy, we do appreciate your service. Um, and, and Amy, you've been working hard, now you have to work harder. <laughs> uh, we have a motion in a second. Uh, Michelle, could you record the vote, please? Ashbrenner? Yes. Bolton? Yes. Gillette? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Munns? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that moves us through our regular agenda items. We're moving into section four, which are information items, uh, board uh, committee reports. And the planning committee is up first. Yes, so per usual, I think many of you were a part of that planning committee meeting. I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation for being able to go through the the reverse osmosis uh, planning and in, in future thought of development of that facility. So thank you. And I don't have anything more to add. Great, thank you. I have a uh, finance and audit committee. I don't have my agenda pulled up here, Ted. Will you help me give this report? Yes, finance and audit committee report. Um, this month, past month, we talked about uh, the phase one park improvement uh, close out the project close out and where we were with the park foundation in terms of um, not only the the capital which is which is within one percent of being closed out but also operations in light of the pandemic and the, their inability to have uh, events and then also the the depreciation fund and we talked about creating a um, an, an agreement there uh, so that everyone understands that we're we're putting that off or there's a forbearance process that um, is, is in writing. Um, we also talked about um, the growth pays for growth proposal uh, that Amy presented on Matt Stoffel's presentation that he gave to the regional micro group. And uh, that was more for the board's information just to understand where we are in that process and, and one of the I would call it interests um, from the other members of, of the group and uh, possible discussion points for the future. Graham, those were the two primary items. Thank you for that. Um, Customer Relations Committee, Sue? Sure. Um, all of you have been receiving the updates of our weekly meetings. In addition, Diane and Jody Smith and John McEwen and I have also had weekly meetings as we look at governance. Um, the remaining question that we really have on governance that we do need some board input from um, is on weighted voting and how we structure really the overall board. Um, I don't know how much of that discussion, Graham, we want to have in an open public meeting and how much because it gets into um, really the strategy of the negotiation of regionalization um, and, and the um, Oh, inclination or preference of this board, but all of the groups, um, Urbandale, West Des Moines, and us, said that we would bring this issue of weighted voting and the importance of it to our particular boards here at the end of the month and make you aware that that is the piece that we do need input on. Diane and Ted, do you want to add? Well, I guess not Ted, more Diane. Um, no, I think that we have this on the agenda. Is it Ted at the next customer relations committee meeting? That's right, Diane. This, this yes. is the topic for discussion at that meeting, which is a week from today. Correct. And we will plan to bring um, information on the, the options for waiting votes and what that means in terms of percentages and what the difference is so that the board can understand and, and consider that. I do want like, to just, go ahead. I was just, no, please. I'd like to add that um, Diane, Ted, Kyle, Amy, and, and a number of other staff uh, members and I have met twice uh, in the last two weeks to talk through um, the 28E, but to talk through kind of the 
the steps, if you will, that uh, we'd like to consider. I, I, uh, kind of, let's let's call them the decision making steps that we think that the board's going to need to make. Um, I think that it would make sense at the customer relations committee meeting that, um, especially if we're going to talk about strategy and negotiating strategy, that we spend a little bit of time um, talking about that decision process as as we've discussed it a little bit, so that the board can come to some understanding about. Um, the timing of decisions and the, the order of decisions. So uh, I, I would suggest that we do, we have that discussion on process, if you will, and then move into, you know, an item like um, uh, governance as, as, as well. And is that, I think it's, and I think that's appropriate to do it at the customer relations committee meeting as, as opposed to waiting to our next board meeting. That would be great. And so um, if we're thinking that we may have a closed meeting, Rick, if you'll just make sure that uh, double check that we notice that properly in the, in the customer relations meeting, that, that is a possibility. Will do. There is one rather broad um, bit of information, and I think we shared this at one of the committee meetings, but I wanna make sure all board members hear it and that we've recorded. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate because Jody Smith was one of the architects and involved in the WRA. And there is a weighted voting um, governance piece of the WRA. So Diane and I tried to dig into this and find out, okay, so how often has that been used and under what types of things? And I think we've shared this at this board, but it's worth repeating because it was from a committee meeting that it's only been used twice. They could not remember one of the two situations, but the other one was involving um, a custodial worker when uh, the city of Des Moines felt very strongly and they exercised the weighted voting. So I thought that was interesting that it has not been used a huge amount um, in making decisions. And I guess that goes to the point of when you're collaborating and bringing all the parties together and sharing all the information, once you have the information, the weighted voting may not be as big of a deal as we would think. So I just, I thought that was interesting. Wanted to make sure everyone on the board knew. That's helpful. That is interesting. So I appreciate it. Uh, while we're on the topic, does anyone know how WRA does weight their voting? Is it by population or otherwise? We were just given the contract, and I think that's something that we do want to share when we all come together. Um, but yes, we we had requested the contract, and Jody shared that with us. Correct, Ted? Yes, we do have the uh, agreement, and we can check and see how they are weighting their votes. That's Excellent. it, Graham. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Before we leave that item, just um, think, I'd, I'd like for all of you to think a little bit about um, the process, uh, the questions that you have about the regionalization process. That will be, we'll discuss that at the customer relations meeting next week. Um, and so there are a lot of steps here and I wanna make sure, as I say, if you have a little time to think about those unanswered questions that you have uh, and that you'll need, answered as you make a decision that might help us chart out that decision process. So um, I look forward to having that discussion. Graham, um, if, I could, yes. if I could add one more thing, and I'm sorry, I had this in oh, my notes please. and I jumped please. right over it. Um, I do wanna thank Jen Terry. She has been participating in all of these, we call them our micro group meetings, um, taking impeccable notes and so the information that all of you are getting, which is a great summary of everything that we discuss to keep all of our regional customers, um, she circulates that with all of us in the committee saying, am I missing anything? Um, and so I just wanna give a shout out to Jen Terry. One day we said, okay, Jen, do you wanna summarize for us the highlights? And she said, well, I have seven pages of notes. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of what a job it is, but thank you, Jen. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, 
I will second that. I really appreciated the quick facts uh, document. It's been very helpful. So. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Good. I thought I'd just jump in. I did. Uh, look, I'm looking at the uh, WRA 2080 agreement, and it provides for population weighted vote. Jenny, you're going to accept your kudos there. I just said thank you. I'm glad you find it useful. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Uh, the Bill Stoke Memorial Committee uh, will look for some updates on that in the next month that we're going to uh, begin talking about and hopefully laying out a plan uh, for that. But I have nothing new to report. The Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, the search for the CEO continues. Uh, the search committee has narrowed uh, the field to four people to interview, uh, which is going to happen soon, which will then be followed by a smaller group, uh, which will, uh, will hopefully the, the group will narrow uh, that to finalists and then there'll be public interviews and others. The only thing really interesting that I have to say about uh, the four is that they're all women. Uh, that have or that are in the, the final four. So uh, that's fascinating to me. Um, the Des Moines Waterworks Park Foundation. Andrea? Sure. So I think the items to note um, in, include uh, the discussion that the Finance and Audit Committee had um, regarding the closeout that um, Mike's been working on. So I don't know if we need to go over that again. Um, I also want to point to the um, Renaissance Group being hired to help with the Park Foundation's um, campaign fundraising, and uh, which, which does us good as they continue to move that bar forward. Um, and also that they are planning their um, strategic planning retreat next month um, and hope for some good momentum to come out of, of, that acti of those activities. Great, thank you. Uh, so item B uh, in section four is a staff update, external affairs. Ted, how are we going to proceed with this? Is this Jen's moment? This is Jen's moment, Graham. We're gonna hand her the baton. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. This is my moment in the sun. Appreciate that. Um, busy time in uh, external affairs. Uh, I think today I'm just going to focus on a legislative update. And then if you have other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, the second week of the legislative session was a very busy week. Uh, many of the bills were unrelated to our issues, but we are monitoring a handful of proposed bills. So I'm going to just quickly let you know what those five bills are, the highlights, and, um, and we're registered as monitoring on all of those at the current time. The first one is HF 75 slash SF 46. It's about hands-free device usage and uh, prohibits any use of an electronic communi communications device while driving. Um, this bill is in subcommittee and I did accept our amendments um, regarding our ability to use our devices when we're in the right of way. So Jenny Puffer was instrumental in helping us get that, as well as Dickinson Law Firm uh, helped us draft that language and it has been accepted. Uh, the second bill is HF 84 with a companion bill in the Senate. This is regarding a fluoridation notice. So it requires public water systems to notify the Department of Public Health and the local Board of Health at least 90 days before discontinuing fluoridation of their water system. So I was sort of intrigued by where this was going. Um, right now we're just monitoring it. We, we don't have any plans to discontinue fluoridating, adding fluoride to our water. So we're monitoring it just sort of on behalf of a public health interest in, in being a public water supply. Um, SF22 is regarding PFAS testing would require the 25 largest cities in Iowa uh, to test the water for PFAS. Again, we are monitoring because we already do PFAS testing. We're just monitoring as a public water system and as a member of the Iowa Association of Water Agencies affecting other utilities in the state. I don't suspect that's going to uh, make it uh, in the long run, but we are monitoring that one. There's an SF1 regarding uh, concentrated animal feeding operations um, in the agriculture committee. Um, I think uh, we're all trying to figure out where this one's headed. So uh, we're, I'm just saying that we're monitoring it. It deems two CAFOs to be a single operation if the operations meet certain, certain distance requirements. 
So, so far, all who have registered have registered as undecided, except I believe one, and I believe that's the Sierra Club. So we haven't sorted out what's going through with that one yet. That one is sponsored by Brad Zahn. Um, and the last one is SSB 1018. It's in subcommittee. It regards a construction manager at risk uh, issues, including our um, uh, governmental um, status, as well as the board of re the regents, the regent universities. Again, this is a really dense bill that we're still working our way through. And depending if it gets much farther, I may need to enlist the help of Dickinson to work me through a couple of, <laughs> of these. So I, I went through it with Mike and Ted. And so I, I just need to be sure that we're catching everything. But we'll see how far it gets for now, I think. Um, last Thursday, we met with, uh, we continue to meet with leadership of the, in, in our state legislature. So we met with the House Majority Leader, Matt Winschittle, who, Matt Winschittle, who lives in Missouri Valley. Uh, we did an update on regionalization, as well as our water quality issues and our legislative priorities. Uh, we have also met with our congressional delegations. I can't remember if I updated on you, you on that or not, but we met with Senators Grassley and Ernstaff, as well as Representative Axney, and they have all been absolutely engaged, and they've immediately started taking action on a couple of our issues, which was, could they look into our FEMA claim for COVID response expenses? And then uh, could they look into PFAS remedial investigations that are going on and, and and what that's going to entail and, and, and where we are on the list and so on. So they've been really responsive to those. Um, that is my update for legislative affairs today. Does anybody have any questions? I've got one, Jen. Um, as quickly as the Biden administration appears to be moving on all fronts, are you? do you have the tools you need to monitor what's going on uh, in the Biden administration, do you feel? Um, do you mean, in, well, um, in well, terms Well, I just of think, I mean, there's a lot of fronts, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there's our ongoing issue with Homeland Security and our, our case there. I mean, that's, that's something I do think you have your arms around and you've met with uh, the congressional delegation here. But, you know, as there become new leaders in the EPA and, and others and their interpretation of the Clean Water Act or what have you. I'm just, I'm just curious to know if you feel like you have what you need to monitor uh, those situations today or if we need to do something different. I guess I, um, for right now, I think we're okay, but I think it's a great question. I, I did, um, I, I kind of started hatching idea in terms of addressing our harmful algal bloom situation in the upper Mississippi. And I was formulating a plan in which we would harness the synergy of um, the new EPA administration along with um, Secretary Vilsack's ties to Iowa and try and work at the federal level on harnessing a coalition and a movement to focus funding and a spotlight and, and action on harmful algal blooms in the upper Mississippi. And, Luckily, as it turns out, I wasn't the only one who had the idea and there's already people at the federal level that are working on this idea, which I think could be really exciting. I think I've already met with maybe eight different organizations on this issue to try and uh, capitalize at the federal level on these issues. So I would, I envision something really big like the Gulf, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative or something really big like that. That would be my goal. So that's what one of the things I'm gonna be working toward um, in a coalition with others. So um, that's one thing that occurred to me. So I'm not sure exactly what all steps the Biden administration is taking yet, but I'm going to continue monitoring. So I think that's a great point. Well, I'm, I'll, exci I'll, I'll follow I'm excited up about that. that. Yeah. And I'm excited about that prospect, Jen, because um, I like the way you're thinking and, and trying to find whether it's coalitions, building coalitions in Iowa, but building coalitions in DC. And, you know, it occurs to me that as you talk to Secretary Vilsack's office and the EPA and others, if there are holes in what we're doing and the way we're monitoring, they'll probably they'll probably become evident to you at that point. But just keep us surprised on what you think you need in order to to keep informed and engaged. You've got a lot of balls in the air. So if there's something, if we need to rethink what we're doing a little bit to make sure we have the right tools in place, let us know. And Diane, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, thank well, you. I was just going to say that I would assume that. Um, the associations that we um, belong to will be doing some of this and hoping that Jen can follow that and get plugged in at the right level. 
Thanks, Diane. That is a great point. I can tell you one of the organization, well, we've met with a few, but one is the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, UMBRA. We met with their executive director and a couple of other folks. They're a conglomeration of state agencies and representatives in Upper Mississippi. So we already plugged in with them. Um, and then we had a meeting with the policy folks with the American Waterworks Association. <laughs> so these are, um, we envision them as being our watchdogs in DC uh, on the farm bill and other issues that, and, and we're inviting them to see themselves this way. So Ted did a great job uh, with them the other day when we met with them. And um, so we hope to engage with people that should be carrying our water for us, absolutely. And, and persuading them to help us at that level. They have a lot more, they have a, a bigger bat to wield than we do at the national level. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm envisioning, you know, I'm envisioning the National Cattlemen Association because livestock, uh, is sickened and can die from harmful algal blooms. I'm envisioning, you know, like pet alliances, dog groups. I mean, everyone, should, these are their issues. Harmful algal blooms are all of their issues. So I'm hoping we can create some real synergy around uh, that diverse coalition. I have a question for you. Those national groups like the um, American Association of Wine Water Work or of Water Works, do all of those groups have a, are we all, on the same page as far mm -hmm. as some of our issues or is there a vast priority or even philosophical value difference in some of those groups? Ted, I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna call you and you're, you're you've been a member of American Waterworks for, <laughs> you told them about three decades. So um, I'm gonna let you weigh in on that one if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the broad strokes, Andrea, are, are similar. We all value clean water and we all value um, source water protection and, and we all um, value uh, a lot of the same things. But when you get right down to uh, the details, um, they are focused on things that affect uh, more of their members. And frankly, uh, things like confined animal feeding operations and, and tile drainage and agricultural land use practices. While that one might affect a number of their members, um, you know, we are somewhat unique in our position here. And some of what they shared with us were things that just, while they might work in other places, they just are not working for us. Um, you know, it, it's unusual for, for the, private ownership of land in a state to be so close to 100% as, as, as it is in Iowa. They were talking to us about things that could be implemented on public lands, which you know as well as anyone is what, less than 1% of the land in, in the state. And they were talking about RCPP projects and how that can be um, a, a great tool. And you know we have those, but we can't spend the money because it's all private land and nobody wants to do the practices. And so um, at, at a very high level, I think we, we share uh, interests and philosophies, but when it gets down to the details, it can be um, more challenging to find alignment between them and us. And I, I think it was a good meeting. I think that um, we were able to leave them speechless a couple of times, Jen, might be the best way to say yes. it. Yes, that's uh, true. But I don't feel like we came out of it with you know them uh, having our back and, and ready to fight for us because they don't know what to do either. So does that answer your question? Sue, and I think that's, you've been raising that, your hand too. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Diane. Well, that's probably correct, but those organizations have people in Washington who are very good at tracking and keeping up on what's going on. So, you know, since we're members, we should take advantage of those things. Yes, Sue, um, did you yeah, have a I, I do. Graham, to your point, um, and we are a member of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, they just announced yesterday that they are going to have a September um, DMDC trip pending COVID so that we can meet new members of the Biden administration in the various groups that are important to us, EPA, Ag, and others. So that might be something that we would certainly want you know, to ensure that Des Moines Water Works were a stakeholder for the partnership. Um, I, know, I know Jen has been real involved in setting the agenda and uh, the kickoff for the federal agenda is this Thursday. So um, we'll wanna make sure that we plant that with 
all of the important initiatives. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, that could be important. This That trip this year could be important if it comes off in September. Anything else for that, Jen That's Terry? a big thing. If it comes off, good point. That's right, if it comes off. Ma'am, could I time. just, before we move on, just Please. comment that Jen has done such a great job of getting us meetings with the people we need to be talking to. Um, we have talked to, I think, everyone. <laughs> but in all seriousness, she's done a great job you know, getting the policy people from AWWA and, and these the Upper Mississippi River Basin Group and anyone who we think might be able to uh, help us, we've been able to get a meeting with. So great job. Thanks, Ted. It has been sort of a jaw dropping experience for some of the folks we meet with. And I think that means we're doing our job, so. <laughs> Discussion is a, good, is a good starting point. So that's great work. Um, Thank you, Jen. Moving on to the CEO and general manager's comments. There's two items that I see, Ted. What else you got? Yep, I want to. I, I got a couple of other things, Graham. One of them is really fast. I just want to point out that under item D, we, we do have our professional service agreements. Um, the board had asked us to begin a list of professional service agreements. That is in the packet for the first time this month there. Michelle has it pulled up. You can see that there are four thus far. So, um, you can have a look at that when you have a chance and, and certainly we're open to feedback if there's something more you would like to see. But that will be in the packet each month and as we add um, professional services agreements as we move through the year, we'll try to keep that up to date. Um, COVID-19 response. Um, I don't have a lot to report there. Utility operations are basically unchanged over the last several months. The vast majority of our staff are now working in the new normal um, in, in teams or in, in separated groups or in um, newly fashioned workspaces and that seems to be moving along well. We, we continue to have a very small number of people at any given time who's impacted either directly as an individual or uh, as a family member. We are starting to see a few family members receive their vaccinations. Those who are in the healthcare industry or long-term care um, are starting to get vaccinated. Those are you know, primarily spouses. Um, the office does remain closed to the public at this time, but I have to say we, we really haven't received any um, expression of concern or, or complaints over that. I think people really figured out how to pay their bills and we've made additional options available to them and they can drop cash in the drop box outside and we go get it multiple times a day and make sure it gets applied. And so that is working, seems to be working fine. We still have some limited work from home, but basically we are, um, we've adapted and we're sort of in a holding pattern here until vaccination moves forward and we can get back more to normal. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our utility goals for the year. Each year, uh, staff goes through the process of identifying a number of initiatives that we believe are important for the utility to complete, uh, and we establish those as utility goals. You'll remember last year, for example, that um, launching our new CIS system, the new wholesale rate structure were goals. This year, we've identified three initiatives uh, in addition to our, our safety initiative that we feel are critically important for the utility and we'd like to share those with you uh, just briefly. The first one of those is uh, treatment capacity, expansion planning, being prepared, understanding where we need to go in the future, whether it's through regionalization or, or not. And, and Mike McKernan is gonna walk us through the goal related to that. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Uh, I'll try and be brief here. There's really uh, two parts of this that drive us to a, to a statement. Um, in quarter one here, we are going to uh, look at some new uh, demands that are out there in the system, in the community, broad community. We're also going to roll in the last six years of operational data from a peak day, from an average day perspective, and have a third party uh, look at that information in light of what was projected in the 2017 long range report. And the, the real purpose of this first step is to say, is the timing of the key projects 
still look okay or should they go back in time or should they come up in time? Um, we hope to be in a position uh, to present that kind of information to the board uh, in early March. So uh, HDR has been tagged to uh, help us with that. And that's one of the items listed on the uh, professional services list. Uh, the second part of this is then in probably quarters two and parts of quarter three is to look at the cost estimates that were in that long range report for the treatment expansions at Sailorville and at McMullen. Uh, those estimates that are in there are, you know, high level. Uh, what we really want to do is, you know, do a deeper dive on the source treatment and transmission uh, projects that would be required uh, to garner that um, treatment expansion uh, number. 12 and a half at McMullen and 10 at, at Sailorville. So we need to do a deeper dive on these cost estimates, come up with something that's more, um, you know, closer to the truth, more accurate. And if we can pull off those two tasks, um, then we get to a point where we can, uh, you know, the final sentence here, you know, we'll be in a position to communicate with confidence, the timing, the location, the rationale, and the cost of the next two significant treatment expansions to be completed in the metropolitan area. That's the that's the, that's the purpose uh, and this work will inform, uh, inform the waterworks or, or inform the region, well, whichever uh, is needed there. So any questions on that first goal? Thank you. Critically important to the utility as we move to completion on regionalization and establish the path forward in terms of uh, where are we going to expand capacity and when, or are we going to sell purchase capacity and for how much? Um, something that's uh, uh, very timely and, and very important to the utility. So thank you, Michael, for that. The second uh, goal for this year, utility goal, relates to uh, the lead and copper rule revisions and our response to those revisions. We had a, a somewhat similar goal last year, but the lead and copper rule is not issued until December 28th. And so now that we've had that, we've refreshed that goal a little bit and Jenny Puffer is gonna walk us through that goal. Yes, yeah, so as Ted said, the new rule is out. It is finalized and ready to hit the streets. The one thing I learned today though, is that the Biden administration has issued an executive order. They want a regulatory freeze pending review on this rule. So that means it could change it again. So I think the part that will change will be how fast the lead services need to be replaced in a community. I think everything else will stay the same. So I'm confident our goal is still a good goal. Um, just wanted to let you know, it still could be a little bit dynamic as we go. So there's three areas we wanna focus on for this lead and copper rule revisions. And keep in mind, these revisions do not have to be implemented for three years from now. So we don't have to take it all in one big chunk this year. We can kind of chip away at it over the next three years to get everything in place. The first thing we want to do is update our public relations campaign. Um, we've got a lot of information out there on lead service lines and lead and water, and we want to revisit that, refresh it. And the one thing we want to do specifically this year is to help customers understand whether or not they likely have a lead service line. So one thing we worked on last year was a piece for our new website. So Des Moines Waterworks will have a new website out sometime this year. And there'll be a page on that website where a customer can type in their address and see whether they think they have a lead service line or not. Keep in mind, we do not have records of what the material for customer service lines are, but we're gonna base it on a couple of things like the date it was installed. Um, and so we're gonna be able to tell the customer you have a suspected lead service line or you don't. And we wanna be able to share with the public what that means. Uh, we don't wanna create panic. We don't want everybody to think I have a lead service line, therefore the water's not safe. Um, so Jen and Melissa are gonna help walk us through how to, to do that in a good way that customers understand what the risks are and what they can do uh, to help reduce some of those risks. The second thing we need to do as part of this rule is we need to do water quality sampling at the elementary schools and the licensed childcare facilities in our area. So I know the lab has already worked with the city or the Des Moines Public Schools in years previous, um, but we need to reach out to those child care facilities now, and that's not something we've done before. So we need to get a list of who all those are, where the addresses are, the contact information. So for this goal coming out, what we'd like to do is develop that inventory of those schools 
and those childcare facilities and figure out how we're going to get this done. We have to do all the sampling in all those facilities over five years. So basically do 20% a year. And so this year alone, what we want to do is put that list together and come up with that game plan of how we're going to get that done. And then lastly, we need to prepare a plan for getting lead service lines replaced. So keep in mind that the customer owns the service lines here in Des Moines, uh, which creates a little bit of a problem because it's hard to force that to get replaced. And so DNR is still working through what that rule is going to entail. Um, you know, if we were to pay for it to get done, we're looking at over $100 million to replace all those lead service lines in Des Moines. But there are some legal questions about can we put public water funds into a private infrastructure replacement? So there's lots of questions out there. We're hoping there'll be some grant money. I know some states are releasing money to help replace lead service lines. Um, lots of questions. And DNR and talking with them, they do not want to see this plan that we provide or we put together for 18 months because they have so many questions. They wanna make sure they understand the rule fully so they can provide good comments on our plan. So we're just gonna come up with a draft plan this year and then we'll finalize it here in the future. Any questions for me on those three mini goals of the bigger goal? When you talk about uh, notifying childcare facilities, uh, what does that entail like at home? childcare providers, things like that? Yeah, so anybody that's registered with the state yeah. is what that's gonna be, so. I'm sure that will be very challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that'll be a new avenue for us and a new way to communicate. And again, we wanna put out a letter that says what we're gonna be doing, um, not to cause fear or panic, but to help them understand we're, we're trying to get some good information for them. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Yep. I understand that, so this rule, this is the proposed rule, is that correct? It's actually finalized here just a couple weeks ago. Oh, it, it was finalized. It so, finally was. It was. Okay, I've got it, thanks. Yep. I guess my other question, we made comment on that rule, mm -hmm. correct? Did correct. they respond to any of our comments? Um, not really. Not really? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for submitting, but yeah. But if it's under review and if there's an executive order, now's our time. Yeah, I want to learn more about what what part they're wondering. Again, I think it's they're trying to get the lead service lines replaced faster because the current rule has if you have an event where you're seeing lead in your water from the samples you're taking, you have to replace 3% annually of your lead service lines. And I think they're a number bigger than 3%. 3 percent isn't a very big number, although if you have a lot of service lines, it can be a big number. And so how I, many do we have, Jenny? 20,000? Around 20,000. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. The, the third goal uh, for this year is, is completion of a facilitated strategic plan. And you've heard us talk about that numerous times. You've heard me talk about it through the budgeting process and um, planning. We do want to complete a facilitated strategic plan this year that's fully supported, uh, has includes a participatory process um, and strategies for communication and change management, as well as action plans for completion and, and um, KPIs. Uh, we also want uh, by the fourth quarter to have established a mission statement for the utility that explains um, who we are what we value, a vision statement that explains what we want to do, what we want to become, and then um, value statements and guiding principles. So uh, a, a full traditional uh, strategic plan that will guide the utility for the next five years. We already have RFPs on the street and we're expecting um, proposals from facilitators in February and we hope to get that process started at the beginning of the second quarter. And those are the three, uh, what I would call 2021 goals, but we also of course have a safety goal and this year's safety goal has a little bit of a different flavor and Kyle Danley is gonna walk us through that. Thanks, Ted. Uh, we met with the central safety team this year to kind of talk through and really evaluate where have our injuries been occurring the past 11 years. And so we uh, reviewed all of our injuries and we've had 144 injuries in the last 11 years uh, looking at the trending, though, 
Um, over those 11 years, we are trending downwards on injuries. So we're heading certainly in the right direction and getting that. In fact, our injuries the last five years have uh, significantly declined compared to uh, the five years pre previous. Uh, but the team looked uh, strongly at all those, uh, looking to see where are we having the most focus. Um, looking at that, there's four categories that we have the most injuries occurring. Uh, that being 29% uh, with muscle strains or overexertion, 22% with slips, trips, and falls, 17% were repetitive motion, and 15% uh, are uh, getting struck by something with that. So those four are giving us about 83% of our injuries are occurring in those four categories. So we wanted to focus again on one of those categories. Uh, last year, we focused on overexertion or um, muscle strains. Uh, so the next list was the slip strips and falls. So that's one issue that we're really uh, focusing on as a team. But more importantly, we wanted to get safety more in front of employees and really recognize that they can make a difference uh, by participating in that or being involved with suggestions and things like that. We have had a near miss reporting um, tool out there for several years. Um, they used to be cards. We now have upgraded those to electronic where they can file that on uh, the computer. Every desktop has an icon that employees can click on to within a matter of a couple minutes report um, a hazard in there or even report um, things that are getting done so that we can make uh, other employees aware of the things that are getting changed and getting done to help uh, them. And so the focus this year is, is really to get people more involved in safety and understanding that every employee has um, the ability to improve the safety culture here at Des Moines Waterworks. And so that um, is what we're doing is showing that through our near miss reporting and getting that information out to employees of what um, hazards are out there and what things that we have done to improve those hazards and also what steps are being done uh, on all the things that are being reported. And so uh, we probably had close to or less than a dozen uh, near miss reports uh, previously. I think this year, we, uh, last week or so, we really stepped up and had several more uh, reporting. We seem to be getting a lot of good feedback from employees seeing that uh, they can be involved uh, with the safety and helping prevent accidents and getting more engaged with that. And so uh, we are asking to try to uh, get at least 100 uh, near miss reporting, which that will be shared. And uh, hopefully all those will be resolved uh, to minimize uh, the safety exposures. And then also focusing on slips, trips and falls this year, since that is 22% of our injuries in the past 11 years. Any questions with that? A much more active goal, a leading indicator instead of a lag indicator this year. So I applaud the group for coming up with that. Um, any questions about the utility goals before I, I, one more thing on my list here. Graham, I would, I would like to just take a minute to, to uh, highlight the fact that uh, this is gonna be Peggy's last board meeting. I'm, I'm sure that's obvious to everyone. She's retiring at the end of the month, but uh, according to my math, this, this is about the 300th board meeting that she's attended. So um, that's a milestone to be sure. And she's retiring with 25 years of service, but as she likes to say, she took a short sabbatical in there. So even though she reached 25 years of service in 2020. Uh, she was actually here before 1995, which is what the math would tell you. She actually was here starting in 1992. And so um, Peggy got to go through the flood, what those the old ones of us <laughs> call the great flood. She was there and thank goodness she was there uh, because she was the one who got to figure out uh, how to pay us all immediately after the flood with, with no payroll system and no check printer. And I'm not absolutely sure how she did that, but she did it. And I'm glad she did um, because uh, I needed the money. Um, <laughs> that was also a time of the flood of 93 that we were uh, spending money uh, like it grew on trees, which Peggy often told us it did not. And she was the one who got to track all of that and reconcile all of that and submit all that to FEMA and fight with FEMA for years over getting reimbursed. And so I'm confident that she was happy that she was here 
uh, during the flood of, of 1993. But um, not too long after that, and maybe a result of the, her FEMA interactions, I'm not sure, um, she did leave in 1997 for the aforementioned sabbatical. Uh, she came back though in 2000 uh, as the director of finance. She had been the controller in her first stint, but after sabbatical, she came back as the director of finance in 2000, just in time uh, to take over operation of the Botan Botanical Center, which uh, she and Don Goodrich managed for a number of years until it was turned over to the friends. Um, I, in fact, remember sitting outside of the Botanical Center one night late with Peggy when that big ladder on the roof had fallen off and crashed through the roof and we were trying to figure out what to do with that while she was managing the Botanical Center. 2005, it was time to take over Southeast Polk Rural Water and Peggy had uh, a major role in, in managing that system uh, as we uh, assimilated Southeast Polk Rural Water into the Des Moines Water Works system. Uh, a number of other examples, I won't, I won't go on and on, but in 2014, she became uh, the CFO responsible for all of our um, business side of the house, uh, as we like to say. And uh, just for good measure, over the last two years, she helped us manage our way through the unexpected loss of our CEO and a pandemic. So um, I wanna recognize Peggy for her 25 years of service. She has been an incredibly dedicated employee, a strong leader and a good friend. Uh, Peggy, congratulations and, and thank you. Thank you for your kind words, Ted. For the record, your paycheck was typed on a typewriter in the shop of Hoover High School in 1993. Thank you. Graham, that's it for me. All I have to say, Peggy, is I, I don't know. Amy has uh, big shoes to fill, especially when it comes to uh, the way you've always explained the, our rate setting process to me every single year and you've listened and patiently answered the same question for me over and over again. Um, uh, so Amy, good luck with that. But um, it's, it's something to walk away from an organization, Peggy, after all these years, but um, you should know that Des Moines Waterworks is better because of you. Thank you. So with that, I think we've uh, gone through our agenda. The one thing that I want to point out, uh, we talked about the customer service, uh, the customer relations committee meeting. And I do want you to give some thought about those questions that you want answered in the process uh, as you see it. So we can discuss that next week. Um, I have volunteered some of you already to do some things. I know that Andrea has a meeting coming up to talk about public policy and legislative uh, affairs types issues. Uh, Joel has been pulled in to review communications planning and, and that sort of thing. Um, but don't wait for me to volunteer you. I mean, what we need to remember is that this is a small board of equals and um, we need to make sure that we're um, pressing the envelope when it comes to asking the right questions and being informed. So if there's something you think we need to be doing or some information you would like to have that's not on an agenda, don't wait for uh, Ted or me or somebody else to suggest it. Let me know and we'll make that happen. So is there anything else for the good of the cause tonight? Hearing none, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved. Moved, I like that. Is there a second? Second. Any opposition? Hearing none, no opposition, we are adjourned. We'll see everybody soon. Thank you, Peggy, best of luck. Yep. All right. Congratulations, Peggy.